In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. The Princess of Wales says it came as a huge shock after tests showed she had cancer. She revealed the news at the same time her children broke up for the Easter holidays. After weeks of intense speculation about her and with King Charles also being treated for cancer, we'll ask what does this mean for the future of the senior royal family? Also tonight, distressing scenes from Moscow. Images of a massacre with at least 40 dead and nearly 150 wounded as gunmen attack a concert hall just outside the Russian capital. Who was behind it? We'll ask the former head of the Russia desk at MI6, Christopher Steele, for his analysis. Good evening. I'm well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal. A positive tone from the Princess of Wales as she informed the world about having treatment for the early stages of cancer after undergoing major abdominal surgery in January. In a pre-recorded video while sitting on an outdoor bench, 42-year-old Catherine said she was now having preventative chemotherapy and wanted to focus on making a full recovery. This comes after weeks of speculation over her health and whereabouts, with conspiracy theories on social media going into overdrive after media agencies said a Mother's Day picture of her and her children wouldn't be used because it had been edited. Now there are questions as to why she's decided to go public with her diagnosis and whether social media pressure played a part in that. This evening, both the Prime Minister and Sir Keir Starmer criticised the speculation surrounding her in recent weeks. Kate Lamble reports. An announcement that ended weeks of speculation. The Princess of Wales has said she's undertaking a course of chemotherapy as part of treatment for cancer. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. I think everyone will have looked at Catherine, and I think they will feel what a courageous and brave young mother she is. I mean, I think our reaction must be here on an absolutely human level, not the fact that she's a future queen, our future queen, and a member of the royal family, but just human to human, mother to mother. Kate's announcement, the month after King Charles announced he was being treated for cancer, will strengthen the spotlight on a condition which affects hundreds of thousands in all walks of life. Every year, around 5,000 women between the ages of 40 and 44 in England are diagnosed with cancer. Now, the risk of cancer increases greatly with age, which is why that age group makes up just 3% of the total diagnoses in women. How cancer is treated and what the outlook might be depends a lot on what type of cancer is detected and how early it's found. In this case, neither of those details have been shared, but the princess says she is well. The Princess of Wales' last public appearance was on Christmas Day, walking to service at Sandringham Church. In January, Kensington Palace said she'd undergone planned abdominal surgery and would not take part in public duties until after Easter. And then, for Mother's Day, the royal couple published a photograph of the princess and her children, which was later found to have been edited. Despite efforts to remain out of the public eye, Kate's well-being has been splashed across front pages. And with limited information, social media has reached in to fill the gaps with speculation, jokes, disinformation and conspiracy theories circulating as to her whereabouts. I just hope that this finally uh, will silence the, the trolls who have written the most absurd, hurtful, painful things on social media about uh, her health, about the marriage, about all sorts of things. And to my horror, mass media um, actually have followed, at least in giving those absurd rumours and gossip, 
uh, the oxygen of publicity. One of King Charles's aims was reportedly for a slimmed down monarchy, reducing the number of working royals. But this now leaves the king and a future queen undergoing treatment, their partners combining royal duties with caring for their families. The idea of a royal family with wider members of the royal family taking up uh, duties across the country is relatively new. We didn't have that uh, in earlier monarchies to anything like the same extent. And therefore, it's hard to find a precedent. Um, but I imagine it will um, adapt uh, as and when the extent of uh, the illness and the recovery becomes clear. It's easy to forget how unusual it is to find out details of the health of senior royals. When Queen Elizabeth II's father, George VI, died, the public knew nothing about his health until after he'd passed away. Nowadays, things are very different. The monarchy is um, tolerated, loved, supported, indeed, to the extent that it is, because it's seen to be uh, doing a good job for the country, honest, um, hard-working, uh, serious-minded, but also with a sense that they're like us, that it cut them uh, and they bleed, uh, they have feelings. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is part of what the modern monarchy is. Radical openness has been followed by a request for privacy. The Princess of Wales says she needs time and space to recover with her family, who, like any other family, will have been left reeling by the news. Kate Lamble reporting there. Now I'm joined by Laura Lee, Chief Executive of Maggie's Charity, Alan Rusbridger, Editor of Prospect Magazine, and Tessa Dunlop, the historian and author. They all join, those two join me in the studio now. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you for coming on on Friday evening. Starting with you, Tessa, I mean, what's your first impression of that video? Well, I think irrespective of whether you're a monarchist or not, it was incredibly moving, but there was something deeper than that. You'll recall on the, on the 17th of January when we discovered um, she'd had a major abdominal surgery, she, she asked us you know, to respect her privacy, to remember that she wanted normalcy for her children. And immediately, I think, and, and weirdly it was reminiscent of when I was a young girl and I'd consumed all the Diana stories and then that terrible news of what happened to Diana, I again felt that, oh, you know, one gets so whipped up in the narrative below the line in the mass media. It very quickly um, gallops out of control. And I think it, it, it's a reminder, we see there visibly Kate's human frailty and so too our flawed humanity reflected back at us through, through her. And it was obviously a very moving moment for her. I mean, her voice was trembling yeah. at points in that video. I mean, Alan, why did she do it, do you think? I mean, was it to do with the social media and the various conspiracy theories that we've been bombarded with in recent weeks? I mean, do you think all of that put her under immense pressure to come out and say something? Uh, I, I believe that was probably behind the, the so-called photoshopped picture, um, but I'm, I'm inclined to believe her explanation today that she wanted to wait until half term um, so that the children wouldn't be in school. So I, I'm sure the pressure from social media has been intense, but I don't, I don't really believe that that was to do with the timing today. I mean, the Prime Minister used quite strong language in a tweet earlier. I mean, he said in recent weeks she has been subjected to intense scrutiny and has been unfairly treated by certain sections of the media around the world and on social media. I mean, Tessa, do you think she's been treated unfairly? I think th there are real questions going forward about this very public institution and a world where we no longer consume our news about the royal family from the regulated fourth estate. But in fact, a lot of the way in which the media responded, they were jumped into it by this groundswell of opinion under the line. You know, the whole story about the photoshopped picture that was driven by social media that then you saw the picture agencies rescind or pull the picture then it arrives in the press actually a day or two late so it, it's 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 very i think it's quite difficult to cast blame there are questions going forward i think from our point of view if we want to remain a monarchy how we protect them um, at the same time as scrutinizing a public institution but as for kate i mean this is extraordinary in her darkest hour it, it is also a 
a hero moment, her finest hour. It was incredibly, I thought it was reminiscent in some ways of Elizabeth's um, South African speech when she was 21, committing her life to service. There was Kate, you know, absolutely under the cosh, physically with its young family that she credits and name checks at the same time as explaining she gets great joy from her royal role and, and calling out to all other people with cancer. It was absolutely pitch perfect. I mean, leading on to the next question really nicely there, I mean, Dame Laura Lee, do you think that Kate speaking so openly about cancer and conveying her experience and how what she's doing is because of her children, the way in which she's done it, do you think that will provide some inspiration, some guidance for other families who are going through something yeah. similar? Absolutely. I mean, what she did today was, was absolutely courageous. And um, people with cancer talk about the courage that they need to go through that. But she also, towards the end, talked about um, hoping that she had hope and that by speaking she was offering hope and that they were, you weren't alone with cancer. And people often talk about feeling a sense of helplessness and a, and a feeling of aloneness. And I think those sentiments that she communicated will have really resonated and will really have impacted positively on people with cancer. The line of work that you're in, I mean, for mums and dads who are watching this, who are perhaps, mm. like I said, experiencing something similar, I mean, is there any advice that you would give them in the light of what we've seen from, yeah, from I mean, Kate today? Cancer's diagnosis is like a pebble and the ripples uh, come out and affect um, everyone from family and friends. And I think what we've seen over the last few months is that she's needed time um, to adjust to recovering from the surgery, but also then the diagnosis and then also the treatment plan, and then being able to talk to her children and then being able to talk to us as a country. And I think it's the same for any young um, family who have children, is you have to take time for yourself to adjust for the news and then you know your children best, you know how best to talk to them and it's getting the support that you need to have those uh, conversations. And Kensington Palace has made clear that the reason she did this today is because mm. of the children and them being on school holidays, giving them the time to digest the news and like any parents would be perhaps concerned about how yeah. others might react to the news yeah. if they were at school so they obviously want to give them the time, those three weeks of holidays yeah. to... Children to need information in little chunks and at different stages and she's got three children of different ages mm -hmm. and those three children have heard the word cancer perhaps in the playground in the community and they will have heard that their, own, their, their grandfather has had a cancer diagnosis. So cancer is already in a, in a way part of the fabric of their language so they'll need time to adjust to this information as she needs time to give them the time for that too. Alan I mean going on to the palace now I mean how do you think the palace has handled this I mean there has been some criticism out there saying that you know the Mother's Day picture being edited was the wrong move and perhaps Kate should have been guided along that along those lines that you know don't put a picture out there that has been photoshopped. Uh, well clearly the photoshop picture was was clumsy um, but I think knowing what we know now, it's difficult to criticise the, the palace. Um, I mean, I think what strikes me about the news tonight is how fragile the monarchy seems. I, I'm, in a nerdish way, quite a regular reader of the court circular, and there are nine names who keep cropping up. Uh, and casting forward to 10 years, uh, we know that two of them are now being treated for cancer. Five of them in 10 years' time will be in their 80s or 90s. Uh, and that really leaves the, a, a, a tiny um, number of people who uh, are going to be able to keep the monarchy running. Uh, and you, you realize it only takes two pieces of medical news, such as we've had in the last two or three weeks, uh, to um, make everything suddenly seem very different and fragile. Because a quote um, from your article in Prospect magazine today, Alan, you say Kate's announcement heightens the increasing sense of fragility about the institution of which she has become such an iconic member. And I guess what you're saying is that you feel that her and Charles not being on the royal circuit at the moment as actively as they usually are adds to that vulnerability. I think so, yes, because uh, I mean, their, their partners will be caring for them, so that's really four out of action. Uh, and as I said, um, the, the Dukes of Gloucester and Kent, who turn up quite frequently in the columns, are n n not as young as they used to be and, and will be in their 80s and 90s. And so in 10 years' time, you're going to have Edward and Sophie, William and Kate, and, 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 um, Kate, uh, and Charles will be by then in his late 80s. Uh, and there are three royals out of action. It's hard to see them coming back. 
So what was, uh, I think, felt a very stable institution for so many years, I think now feels fragile. Do you think that's the case, Tess? I mean, do you think there is a, you know, a vulnerability there with the royal family at the moment with those well, two I, senior people not on the circuit as actively it, as indeed. they Indeed. I mean, in terms of, they are spread thin. But I, I would question whether those who consume royal news all do it through the court circular. And actually, I think what the royal family, to an extent, has been lacking in modern times is a raison d'etre. And funnily enough, I think that Kate, in many ways, uh, you know, monarchy historically has always done best when we look up to it. I know that sounds old fashioned, but in so many respects, you know, we need someone to curtsy down to and to look up to. And today I saluted Kate. I thought it was incredibly brave. And I think huge numbers of people, irrespective of where they stand on the, the institution of monarchy, thought now that is a woman who's impressive. And, and it's, it's great. We all need someone who makes us feel a bit humble. And, and she did that. So, so in some ways, the, the irony is, that the, for, for, for the role of ro royalty, she, she gave it some today. I think, Laura Lee. I think, you know, she is going through cancer treatment, but she will come back to having a productive um, life. So please let's not uh, write off someone yeah. because they've got a cancer diagnosis to not be able to go on and fully come back to contributing. Back to the um, court to circular. Thought. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and she finished the video with um, those powerful words. She said, you're not alone. That was quite a moment, wasn't it? It was absolutely a moment. And that moment, it, that, I felt it, and I'm sure everyone else did. Um, you know, one in two of us get a cancer diagnosis. More of us are surviving cancer. Um, you know, we're, we're not alone. And she's helped other people feel less alone too. Going back to the social media side of things, because um, a lot of that has been written about since the news broke at around six o'clock today. I mean, some people have even come out apologising for getting caught up in the social media frenzy. Um, I mean, do you think there is a limit on how much privacy the royal family is entitled to? I mean, Tessie, you're squirming there. I, I think it's a really difficult question going forward. If it was just, as Alan said, cutting the ribbons, waving, your traditional mainstream media taking a picture, on it would trundle, but actually their right to privacy, and clearly they have a right to privacy, and Kate, this posed but pale and wan face today, a reminder of that need for privacy, but where do you draw the line and how do you control the drawing of the line? It's a question I think that we don't yet have the answer to, because the, the age-old rumour mill has all these new tools. And when you've got the Prime Minister coming out saying that she's been treated unfairly, I mean, Alan, do you think this could lead to questions about the way social media sites are allowed to operate? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, the so-called mainstream media has behaved pretty well over the last month uh, and has shown a, a great deal of restraint. Um, with, with social media, it's, it's difficult. Um, it, it, it's a mixture of the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, and it's very difficult to imagine charging in and trying to restrain people who are saying legal things, however ugly and uh, cruel they may be. I mean, the, the question of, uh, of how much privacy this family is entitled to is, is uh, as we were saying, it's a, it's a very difficult one because uh, certainly, you know, at the moment in, in, the, in their present condition, uh, Kate and William, Charles and Camilla need uh, time to uh, heal and recover. Uh, and no one, I think, would disagree with that. But I think if the, 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 the fact that the monarchy is based on people, it's based on a bloodline, and there are so few of them, uh, it's difficult to argue that they have a complete right to privacy. I, I think it has to be a qualified uh, concept of privacy. And let's not forget that people are being investigated for trying to get her medical yeah. files. I mean, it conveys how desperate some people in the pub, you know, people are to find out exactly what was wrong with them. It's Perhaps a money that game. pressure played a part. Yeah. Yes. And don't forget that money drives a huge amount of this. The, you know, the returning from the farm shop, that footage went for a small fortune, sold to two major media players. So uh, clicks drive revenue in, in a media world that's always hungry for a story. And it, you, you realise that the, when the human target is vulnerable, and a, a, a youngish mother with young children, th th then questions have to be asked. And I think we can all also ask ourselves questions. We're all clicking. We're all driving that revenue. But does their behaviour and how they have handled these difficult last few months, does that not ask all of us to behave better too? Mm. And maybe that's, uh, that's one of the, the benefits that might come out of what's happened over the last few weeks. Can I just finish on you, um, Dame Laura Lee? I mean, what is 
your hope from watching this video today and working in cancer yourself in Cancer Care, and a charity that does a lot of work for families affected by it? Well, I think it's this balance of that we've been talking about. Openness is wonderful because it allows other people to um, not be alone, but also we have to respect what different families and different needs are, and they're a family first and foremost. They're a family that we love and value, um, and, and let's take their lead by what they need. Thank you so much, Dame Laura Lee, Alan Rusbridger and um, Tessa Dunlop. I thank you for coming in this evening. Now, just hours ago, a number of armed men stormed into a concert hall on the outskirts of Moscow and opened fire. The images, many unverified, are distressing. They were wearing camouflage and video from the scene shows people lying on the floor as the gunman shot indiscriminately at them. Russian intelligence is saying at least 40 people have been killed. The attack happened before a pop concert. Outside the building, more unverified videos on the internet appear to show it on fire with reports of people still being trapped outside. Christopher Steele, former head of the MI6 Russia desk, joins me now. And here in the studio also with us is Domitella Sagramoso, a senior lecturer in security and development at King's College London. Thank you both for joining me. I mean, first of all, starting with you, Dr. Domitello, talk us through the events as you understand them. Well, it seems that there was a group of maybe four or five uh, fighters armed, uh, terrorist armed, who sort of stormed into this uh, theater uh, while people were already inside and they started shooting. And, uh, and it seems that then somehow uh, sort of there were other explosions. It's very difficult to know the details. And, uh, and uh, they were also on their way out. They, they shot at people in the queue trying to get in. Uh, and apparently there was uh, efforts, of course, to, to go after them, but they seem at the moment, from the information that I have, that they have uh, so far escaped in a car. So it's all a bit, a bit uh, unexpected uh, and, and quite terrible, uh, we, really. We appreciate you telling us what you know, because I know all the information is not clear at the moment, and some of the footage, as we said, is unverified. Um, Christopher Steele, the Russian Foreign Ministry has called it a bloody terrorist attack. Who is behind this, do we think? Hi, uh, it's difficult to tell at an early stage who's behind this. I mean, I think what will be interesting will be to see whether these terrorists actually originated from within Russia itself. If you go back to the Nord Ost siege in 2002, if you recall, there was a similar incident in Moscow in which a lot of people died. And it was proven in the end that these were terrorists that had come up from Chechnya. Uh, and Dagestan. And I think what's interesting about this potentially is that it's an indication maybe that there is serious unrest and a growth of Islamic extremism within the southern Russian republics. And that could be connected with the war in Ukraine in the sense that uh, conscription and deployment of young men from those areas to Ukraine has been disproportionate and the losses there have been very heavy. We know that the Reuters news agency, just before we came on air, is reporting that Islamic State have claimed responsibility for the attack, but we also know they've done that before and it hasn't been the case. Dr. Domatella, I mean, what do you make of those reports? Well, I think in this case, uh, you know, it's quite interesting because it's Islamic State Khorasan, which is Islamic State of Central Asia. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a part of the Islamic State that is fighting in Afghanistan and also in Western Pakistan. And they tend to recruit quite well among Central Asians. For example, if we think of the attack that occurred in Iran, uh, in Kerman in January, it involved two Tajiks, Tajik citizens uh, or ethnic Tajiks. So uh, apparently there is you know, among this um, ISIS, uh, ISIS K or ISIS Khorasan, there is a group of very sort of active and very militant Tajik fighters who tend to operate quite aggressively. Now, we do not know the nationalities of these individuals because they haven't been caught apparently yet. But I wouldn't discard, for example, the presence of Central Asians rather than, um, than from the Northern Caucasus. But as, as uh, Ambassador Steele was noting, I mean, it's very hard to, to tell now, uh, mm. you know, who is behind. But I wouldn't be surprised that this is individuals coming from Central Asia because they have been quite active and they tend to recruit. And also Central Asians can get into 
Russia probably more easily than if they were from other nationalities. Because of the geography. I mean, Christopher Steele, in early March, the FSB said it stopped an attack on a synagogue in Moscow that was being planned by an Islamic State cell. Yes, and in fact, the American government about 10 days ago, I believe, issued a warning to American citizens and others that uh, an Islamic extremist terrorist attack might take place in Moscow, St. Petersburg. So there does seem to be some knowledge of this beforehand. Um, and, and that's why it's a, it's a wake up call, really, in a sense, because it may well be the case that the, the Russian security services have been um, drawn into the, the fight in Ukraine to such an extent they've taken their eye off the ball with regard to Islamic extremism and terrorism within and around Russia. Yes, because, as you said, the U.S. issued a warning uh, saying that it was monitoring reports that extremists have imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow to include concerts. I mean, what do you think this means for Vladimir Putin's position? Is there a danger, do you think, that he could be seen to have ignored these warnings, taken his eye off the ball, perhaps? Yes, I mean, that was the point I was just making. And I think certainly when this happened, uh, you had Beslan in 2004, if you remember the school siege in which a lot of children died. And as I mentioned, the Nordost siege in 2002 in Moscow. These were low points really for Vladimir Putin's reputation as a strong man, as a security czar within Russia. And it may well be that Russia under the surface is a lot more volatile and a lot more unstable than people imagine looking at you know, last weekend's election results, as it were. Um, and I think this will be a theme going forward. I mean, Dr. Donatella, I mean, Vladimir Putin has only said recently that Russia is at war with Ukraine rather than in the midst of a special military operation, which is the phrase that obviously he's been using. I mean, could this have anything to do with today's events, do you think? I don't think so. But what is worrying from the Ukrainian point of view is that this is used uh, as an excuse to sort of increase the lethality of the attacks. We know that last night there were massive attacks throughout Ukraine, also hitting a hydroelectric station. Uh, so the situation is particularly dire for Ukrainians. And Ukrainians have expressed now the concern that this could be used you know, as, a, as an additional excuse to, to hit even harder at Ukraine. Uh, but I think what is really important now is to wait and see what is going to be uh, the position of the Kremlin, if they're going to recognize, for example, that it was ISIS or a splinter group of ISIS, or whether they're going to say, as for example, uh, former President Medvedev was already hinting uh, that Ukraine was behind, which was very, I think, a very risky and dangerous uh, proposition. Mm. And, and so I think we need to be very, very careful and make sure that this doesn't escalate further and that, uh, you know, it's, you know, it, there, there isn't sort of taking advantage of this situation. Christopher Steele, you're nodding away there. I mean, the White House has quickly said there is no indication that Ukraine or any other Ukrainians were involved in the attack. Yes, I mean, I'm nodding away because um, there is intelligence circulating at the moment to suggest that the Russians may be about to launch a major offensive uh, in, the, in the Ukraine. Uh, and that does worry me. The timing of this, if anything, is slightly suspicious and odd, and even if it is a terrorist attack, it may be used in some way to justify uh, an upping of the, of, of the offensive in Ukraine and Russian military operations there. As, as you said, I think um, Peskov, the spokesman, talked about Russia being at war today uh, in Ukraine for the first time. So I would share the concern uh, of that, certainly. And Sorry, you're nodding yeah, away. Please come in. Excuse me. No, may I add, because, you know, the, the risk is also that from my discussions today with my colleagues in Moscow is that people interpret this as a Ukrainian attack. And so the pressures for further action, despite having it been disproven as coming from Ukraine, you know, might increase. So we also need to consider the opinion of the Russian public in response to these attacks. Uh, even though it is proven that it was behind, you know, ISIS was behind, there might be sort of an attempt to make a connection with Ukraine. So the Russian public might demand you know, sort of much tougher action in Ukraine that we see at the moment, which is hard to imagine, but we can still see, you know, further the escalation. So this is also an element which I thought would, would be interesting to share with you. That's, thank you very much for both of you to coming on this evening. Appreciate it. Thanks.
Now, last year, university students Barnaby Weber, Grace O'Malley Kumar, and caretaker Ian Coates were killed in a frenzied knife attack in Nottingham by a man suffering with severe mental illness. The Crown Prosecution Service accepted Calla Kane's guilty pleas to three counts of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. A review examining the actions of the CPS in relation to the case will be published on Monday. Yasmin Ara Khan has been speaking to Dr. Sanjoy Kumar and Emma Weber, the parents of the two student victims, about how they feel the case has been handled. In January, bereaved families arrived at Nottingham Crown Court to hear a case involving the brutal killings of three people, their loved ones, and attempts to kill a further three. Family have been let down. But when the day came, there was no trial, no murder conviction, and no prison and sentence even though the killer admitted the crime. True justice has not been served today. We as a devastated family have been let down by multiple agency failings and ineffectiveness. The CPS did not consult with us, as has been reported. Instead, we have been rushed, hastened and railroaded. Barnaby Weber was one of Calla Kane's victims. Emma, Barnaby's mother, was expecting him to be tried for murder. When we went to Nottingham, um, the day after Barney had been murdered. And the very first person we saw was the Chief Constable. And her first words to us were, don't worry, we've got him, he's going down. And I think I foolishly took it uh, verbatim that, that the criminal justice system would do the right thing. The killer, Valdo Calacane, had a history of schizophrenia. He had once turned up at MI5 headquarters with the delusion that the agency was controlling him. His rampage through Nottingham in June last year left two 19-year-old students and a 65-year-old man dead. He tried to kill others, running them down in a stolen van, leaving three with life-changing injuries before he was stopped. Although he was charged initially with murder and attempted murder, five separate forensic psychiatrists all agreed that his severe mental illness meant he had a partial defence of diminished responsibility. The CPS concluded that there was no realistic prospect of conviction for murder. The prosecution and the court accepted the pleas of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility and the judge ordered Calla Kane to be detained in a secure hospital for treatment. Dr Sanjoy Kuma the father of Grace O'Malley Kuma feels the system is not working for families and like Emma was deeply disappointed Maybe. that there was no murder charge. We are law-abiding citizens, we believe in laws, we believe in the police, we believe in the right thing to do by people. I think all of the families, and I'm sure the families wouldn't mind me saying that all of the families felt utterly, utterly let down. Technically he could have killed tens of people that day in Nottingham. If you can't get someone like him a life tariff, then I can't understand in the country who deserves a life tariff. Following Calla Kane's conviction, the government chief law officer, the Attorney General, commissioned a rapid inspection of the actions of the Crown Prosecution Service to look at whether it was appropriate to accept the manslaughter pleas and to determine whether the CPS adhered to the requirements set out in the Code of Practice for Victims of Crime and the Bereaved Family Scheme. That report is expected on Monday. The Crown Prosecution Service told Newsnight, we are fully engaging with the review. One of the country's most experienced forensic experts told us any other result in any case like this would have been unlikely. I can understand the difficulties um, on the face of it with someone not getting a murder charge, but this is the law in the UK. It's, you know, it's very clear cut that he meets the criteria. And if that's the case, then... Um, this, this is, the, um, this is the, 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 the consequence that it's, it's a manslaughter um, conviction. But the families believe the process was effectively carried out behind closed doors without taking them into account. I don't want to be an expert and I, I don't want to unduly criticise the legal system, but I've lost all faith and respect in our British judicial system at the moment. Grace was a wonderful child. Um, to refer to her in the past just absolutely wrenches my heart. And it's been really, really tough, you know, for a family who've lost someone. They should be able to, to grieve, 
but we've not had that chance. We've had to get really back in the fight. When a horrific crime has been committed, victims, the bereaved and wider society expect justice to be done and to be seen to be done. But without a public trial, with no murder conviction and without the sense of punishment or retribution that a prison sentence brings, can the desire for justice be satisfied? That's all from us this evening. Kirsty is back on Monday. Until then, have a lovely weekend. Good night.